Welcome back to Bombastic Nation and Ting and Ting and Ting. I'm Mr. Giant and I'm back with some more vibes for all you and we continue in with Napoleon's mas uh, Marshals. Uh, I ain't even try to pronounce it. I'ma just let the commentator pronounce it. Thank you guys for watching it with me. Remember to hit that notification bell, uh, button so you know when I'm sending out videos, you know, if you subscribe already. If you haven't subscribed and you're about to subscribe, make sure you hit the notification bell also when you subscribe so you know when I'm bringing out new videos and thing. You know what I mean? Come back, watch the vibes with me. We're watching it together now. Well, yeah, I'm not just sitting here reacting to it. You guys are watching it with me, so comment down below. Give me new ideas to watch and, you know, just comment and give me extra information and thing. You know what I mean? I'm no expert on history. I'm learning as I go. And it's best to hear the history from the people where the history is made. You understand what I mean? It's like, I could tell you about Grenada. You tell me about Germany. You tell me about Russia. You tell me about France. You tell me about Italy. And I'll tell you about Grenada. I plan to go live here real soon. I'm looking forward to that, you know what I mean? I've never done it before, so I don't have any uh, moderators or whatever you call it. It'll just It's just going to be a meet and greet type of vibe for the first one and thing, you know? And then later we, we could come up with some ideas of what we could do together. You understand what I see and thing? But let's go ahead and watch this here. This is uh, Napoleon's Marshals. That's YouTube and Sim Simmer. Part four, baby. Terror belly, decus pacis. Terror in war, honor to pass. The words inscribed on every French marshal's battle. All right, that though. In France, the title of marshal or maréchal goes back at least to the 13th century. It represents the highest possible position of military authority. Authority symbolized by a marshal's baton. The title was abolished during the French Revolution as incompatible with the egalitarian spirit of the age. But in 1804, Napoleon founded a new empire and restored the ancient rank. This is Epic History TV's guide to Napoleon's marshals. All 26 have been ranked according to our own evaluation of their achievements as marshals. With expert guidance from Lieutenant Colonel Remy Pot, former chief historian of the French Army. So far, we've met Marshals Perignon, Brune, Serrurier, Kellerman, Grouchy, Monsey, Poniatowski, Jourdan, Bernadotte, Augereau. Lefebvre, Mortier, Marmont, Saint-Cyr, Oudinot, Victor, and Murat. Who could be a more fitting video sponsor than NapoleonSouvenirs.com, the online shop for fans of the Napoleonic era? See, so yeah, I gotta go Since check this out. The team at NapoleonSouvenirs.com has offered the finest quality gifts and souvenirs for those who adore this dramatic period of history. No aspect of the Napoleonic era has been forgotten. With busts and statuettes of the Emperor himself, Napoleon-themed champagne, and stunning replicas of Napoleonic swords and pistols, as well as uniforms and flags of the Conde d'Armée and Imperial Guard, and even the baton of a Maréchal. You can visit their online store at napoleonsouvenirs.com, or if you're lucky enough to be in Paris, visit the Boutique Napoleon in person. Vive l'Empereur! And thank you to NapoleonSouvenirs.com for sponsoring this video. I have to see that because I, I might go check this out myself. Nine. Marshal Bessier. Bessier! If I'd had Bessier with me at Waterloo, my God would have bought me victory. Brought me victory. Hmm. So, he's saying something really cool about Bessier here. Let's see what this man's life was all about here now. Or his career, Jean I should say. Bessier was the son of Jean a Baptiste. with a relatively prosperous upbringing in southwestern France. When the French Revolution began, he volunteered for the National Guard and was sent to Paris to join the King's Constitutional Guard, 
along with his old school friend, Georges-Jean Murat. This unit was soon disbanded, but Bessières remained in Paris and was among the soldiers defending the Tuileries Palace when it was stormed by the mob on the 10th of August, 1792. In the aftermath, he needed to get out of Paris in a hurry, so he volunteered to fight on the Pyrenees front. His bravery and good sense won him a commission in the 22nd Chasseurs, and he distinguished himself at the Battle of Boulou. Transferred to Italy, his friendship with Murat got him noticed by the army commander, General Bonaparte, who was impressed enough to make him commander of his new bodyguard, known as Les Guides de Bonaparte. Bessier distinguished himself as a cavalry commander in Italy, and later Egypt, winning promotion to brigadier and loyally supporting Napoleon at every turn. He became one of the few men that Napoleon regarded as a true friend. Yeah. Wow. When Napoleon became first consul of France in 1799, he rewarded Bessières with command of the elite consular guard cavalry, which he led with devastating effect at Marengo the next year. In 1804, Bessières became a marshal, less for any great military achievement than for being a loyal member of Napoleon's inner circle. Bessières himself was well-liked, kind, well-mannered and generous, a pious Catholic and social conservative who liked to powder his hair in the old style. His young wife, Marie-Jeanne, was also a favorite at court, doted on by Napoleon and Empress Josephine. In 1805, Bessières commanded the Imperial Guard. In December that year, at the Battle of Austerlitz, he played a crucial role repelling the Russian guard at the battle's climax. At Eylau, in 1807, his squadron supported Murat's mass cavalry charge and made their own disciplined attacks to cover his withdrawal. However, Bessiat's opportunities for glory were limited. Napoleon always held the guard back as his last reserve, as at Friedland. In 1808, Bessières received his first major independent command in northern Spain. That May, the country erupted in revolt against the French. Bessières reacted quickly and decisively, securing key towns and roads. He then attacked Spanish forces at Medina de Rio Seco, winning a crushing victory against an enemy that outnumbered him two to one. But once the immediate crisis had passed, he hesitated and failed to exploit his victory. When Napoleon arrived in Spain, Bessier was given command of the reserve cavalry, a role he retained for the war against Austria in 1809. In May, Bessier and his cavalry were among the first across the Danube, with Massena occupying the village of Asper on his left and Lann holding Essling on the right. When the Austrian commander, Archduke Charles, launched a massive and unexpected counterattack, Bessier, outnumbered four to one, made a series of desperate charges, helping to save the army from disaster. It came at a high cost. Bessier and his cavalry performed bravely. But that night, a long-running feud with Marshal Lann nearly came to blows when Lann accused Bessier of hanging back. The matter went no further, as Lann was fatally wounded the next day. Bessier commanded the cavalry again at Wagram, leading a major attack to cover Massena's redeployment to the left wing. As the charge began, a cannonball killed Bessier's horse and injured his leg. A rumor reached the Imperial Guard that Bessier was dead. Some old veterans began to weep for their old commander until they were assured he was only wounded. That was quite a cannonball, Napoleon told Bessier. It reduced my guard to tears. Oh, wow. As a devout Catholic, Bessier was critical of Napoleon's divorce from Empress Josephine, leading to a short spell out of favor. In 1811, he was sent back to Spain to command the Army of the North. He found an impossible situation. 
widespread in See, just one little <laughs> just one little disagreement with Napoleon, he's like, Oh, can't trust you. You gotta go. You're out of favor for a while. You know what I'm saying? But it's kinda crazy how uh people incorporate religion and politics and war all in one, you know? Especially here where we live in a place where they say religion is separate from politics. No, it's not. Because every politician that that, that runs for power here has to prove that they go to church every Sunday. They have to prove that they kind of pious in some shape or form. So, so a lot of these people do vote for them. So it's not separate. Because if it was separate, these people wouldn't believe in it. Uh, but and, and then again, you see, it's important that there is a correlation as far as politics is concerned because look how he was, you know what I mean? And everybody looked up to him and loved him. He's pious and he's generous. And you know, a person isn't generous because they're religious. A person is generous because they're human. But people equate good deeds with religion. But I'm going off the subject. Let's see what Bessier and the, well, you know, it shows on the screen what happened to him, but let's pick, see some more of his exploits. Insufficient troops and supplies. He wrote bluntly to Napoleon, stating that the French must give up territory, something the Emperor would never allow. For all his piety and refined manners, Bessier ordered his share of executions and reprisals in his attempt to pacify northern Spain. Brutal methods used by many French commanders in this conflict. Later that year, he joined forces with Marshal Massena's Army of Portugal to take on Wellington's army at the Battle of Fuentes de Onoro, but was widely blamed for refusing to send in his cavalry to support Massena's attacks. Unfortunately for Napoleon, this was typical of how many marshals behaved in his absence. They'd rather watch another marshal fail than help them to wow. win the glory. In 1812, Bessier accompanied Napoleon into Russia, commanding his guard. Cavalry. As pious as he is, he did Since that. Since the guard was kept in reserve, he saw little action until the retreat, when he led the advance guard, clearing a path for the survivors. The disaster in Russia left Bessier severely demoralized. But he was resolved to do his duty, now serving once more as Napoleon's cavalry commander in Marshal Murat's absence. On the 1st of May, 1813, Bessier was scouting enemy positions before the Battle of Lützen, when a cannonball hit him in the chest, killing him instantly. His death robbed Napoleon of a dependable commander and one of his last remaining friends. It is surely a great loss for you and your children, Napoleon wrote to his widow, but an even greater one for me. Me, Napoleon says. <laughs> Marshal MacDonald. Good and brave, but unlucky. Jack MacDonald's father was a Scotsman who'd supported Bonnie Prince Charlie's bid to seize the British throne in 1745. After this ended in defeat at Culloden, the family fled to France. Inspired by tales of the Trojan War, MacDonald chose a military life and became a lieutenant in Dillon's Irish Regiment, a French unit made up mostly of Irish émigrés. In the Revolutionary Wars, he won a reputation as a hard-working, intelligent and brave officer, and served as aide-de-camp to General de Maurier, commanding the Army of the North. He distinguished himself in that general's famous victory at Jemap, paving the way for rapid promotion from lieutenant to general in just two years. He led his division well during campaigns in Holland and Germany and formed a close bond with one of France's most successful commanders of this period, General Moreau. In 1798, he was sent to Rome as governor and later commanded the army of Naples. Summoned north the following year to reinforce Moreau's army of Italy, he was nearly killed in a skirmish with Austrian cavalry, and while still suffering from his wounds, his army was defeated at the Trevia by a larger coalition force commanded by the great Russian general Suvorov. 
but MacDonald's own conduct won approval from General Bonaparte, among others. Later that year, he assisted Napoleon's seizure of power in the coup of 18 Brumaire, ensuring the loyalty of the troops at Versailles. He was rewarded with an army command in Switzerland, and that winter led his men through the Alps to attack the Austrians in Italy. His march was far more challenging and dangerous than Napoleon's, but was never immortalized in quite the same way. In 1804, Napoleon was like, oh, me. General Moreau was arrested and charged with involvement in a plot to assassinate Napoleon. MacDonald stood up for his friend's reputation, an act of loyalty typical of the man, but disastrous for his career. Moreau was exiled. MacDonald was placed under police surveillance and retired to his country estate in disgrace. Five years passed before Napoleon, desperate for experienced senior commanders, asked him to serve as military advisor to his 27-year-old stepson, Prince Eugène, now commanding the Army of Italy. MacDonald and Eugène worked well together, driving back the Austrians, and by an awesome feat of marching, joined Napoleon near Vienna in time for the Battle of Wagram. The second day of the battle was MacDonald's moment. Entrusted by the Emperor with the main attack on the enemy center, he formed his troops into a giant open-backed square and advanced into a hail of fire. Advancing in a hail of fire, the boy, that's crazy. Through his telescope, exclaimed several times, What a brave man! What a brave man! MacDonald's costly attack helped to secure a great victory. The next day, Napoleon went to find him on the battlefield and greeted him with the words, Let us be friends from now. You have acted valiantly and given me the greatest services. On the battlefield of your glory, where I owe you so large a part of yesterday's success, I make you a Marshal of France. You have long deserved it. In addition, MacDonald received the title Duke of Taranto and a large pension. But as time would prove, his loyalty remained to France, not to Napoleon. Here we go again. MacDonald spent an unhappy year in Catalonia, commanding troops in what he regarded as an immoral war. In his memoirs, he even praised the noble and courageous resistance of the Spanish. In 1812, he was given command of 10th Corps for the invasion of Russia. This corps, composed of German troops and reluctant Prussian allies, guarded the left flank of the invasion and had a relatively quiet campaign. In December, the Prussians suddenly agreed an armistice with the Russians, leaving the loyal remnants of MacDonald's corps to fight their way back to Poland. By 1813, Napoleon relied on MacDonald as one of his senior marshals. In August, he gave him command of the forces keeping watch on General Blücher's army of Silesia. But when MacDonald advanced across the Katzbach River, torrential rain and flooding caused chaos among his troops, just as they encountered Blücher's army. Blücher launched an immediate attack, and MacDonald's army was routed. Thousands of his new conscripts surrendered or deserted. Hundreds were driven into the river itself. MacDonald took full responsibility for the disaster, though his lack of cavalry and some bad luck were also to blame. Napoleon certainly continued to respect MacDonald's military judgment. He continued to command 11th Corps and was in the thick of the fighting at Leipzig two months later. MacDonald was with the rear guard when the French retreat began and was shocked to see the chaos that engulfed the army. When the Elster Bridge was blown too early, he himself was trapped on the wrong side of the river and just managed to swim to safety under enemy fire. Man. Donald <laughs> continued to serve Napoleon as a loyal and reliable commander throughout the 1814 campaign, effectively serving as his deputy at several key moments. 
Unlike most marshals, MacDonald was never under Napoleon's spell and always spoke his mind to the Emperor. This in itself was a valuable service, though it sometimes led to heated arguments. Perhaps inevitably, in April, it was MacDonald and Ney who took the lead in confronting Napoleon with the facts of his situation. The war was lost, and he must abdicate. Napoleon named MacDonald as one of the three men who would negotiate with the Allies, telling his foreign minister, the Marquis de Colincourt, MacDonald does not like me, but he is a man of his word, of high principles, and he can be relied on. In their last meeting, a few days later, Napoleon told MacDonald, I did not know you well. I was prejudiced against you. I have done so much for so many others who have abandoned me. And you, who owe me nothing, have remained faithful. I appreciate your loyalty. Too late. MacDonald was kept on as a military advisor by France's restored Bourbon monarchy. He continued to speak his mind, so much so that Louis XVIII nicknamed him his outspokenness. During the Hundred Days, MacDonald remained loyal to the king and attempted to rally troops to fight against Napoleon. When he saw this was futile, he escorted the king to safety in Belgium, then returned to Paris, where he refused to meet with Napoleon. After Man, that's some brick. Yo, 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 yo. That is some serious bravery, boy. But it seems like there was a sense of chivalry then, you know, you don't just like murder people. Well, you do, but he went back to France. I wouldn't go back, seeing that I didn't, you know, show loyalty to Napoleon. But he went back. I guess it's for love of country or something like that. But he went back there and, and refused to, to, to speak to Napoleon. You know what? He's up there with my mom for me. He's up there with my mom. Yeah. Two favorites now. McDonald and my mom. Realizing the last elements of Napoleon's Grande Armée and helped many officers to escape arrest by the Bourbons. MacDonald was a methodical, reliable, if unspectacular, commander. But he distinguished himself, above all, by his lack of vanity or personal ambition. Okay. His complete loyalty to You're going ahead of our mama. to speak his mind. Virtues that were all too rare among Napoleon's marshals. Okay. MacDonald, I'm loving you now. Marshal Massena. Marshal Massena. He came alive when surrounded by danger. When defeated, he was always ready to begin again. As if he was in fact the victor. Huh, another, another good saying here by Napoleon for somebody. Let's see what his uh, career was about. Andre Massena was born in Nice. At that time, not technically part of France, but of the kingdom of Piedmont Sardinia. His father, a shopkeeper, died when he was young. So he ran away to sea, then at 17, enlisted in the French army. He was quickly made a sergeant, but a commoner could rise no higher in the Royal Army. So after 14 years service, he quit. When the French Revolution began, he re-enlisted in the local volunteer battalion. Massena, supremely self- wait, wait a minute, a commoner couldn't rise higher than sergeant. Wow, talk about keeping the poor people down. <laughs> you can't even get ahead. You can only get so far enough and... Okay, you plebeian, stay where you are, man. Know your place. Wow, that's crazy, you know, to think you could, you know, move up. But I guess in, in, in his circles, being a, a commoner, uh, he's really looked up to for reaching the highest poss uh, possible rank. Massena, supremely self-confident and unfazed by any challenge, was elected to command the battalion and led it with success against the Austrians on the Piedmontese front. Despite his lack of education, he proved an instinctive combat leader. He was soon promoted to brigadier and after leading a successful attack at the Siege of Toulon, was made General of Division. He won an impressive victory over the Austrians at Loano in 1795, and when the Army of Italy's commander, General Scherer, 
resigned over lack of support from the government in Paris, many expected Massena to replace him. Instead, the job went to the 26-year-old General Bonaparte, 11 years younger and much less experienced than Massena, but with far better political connections. Politics. Nevertheless, Napoleon and Massena worked together brilliantly. Massena commanded his advance guard and played a major role in several of his early victories. In reports, Napoleon described Massena as active, tireless, audacious. He won so many battles that Napoleon acclaimed him l'enfant gâté de la victoire, the spoiled child of victory. Massena was, however, notorious for extorting vast sums from the local Italians, often while his own troops went hungry and without pay. In 1798, Massena received his first independent command, the Army of Switzerland. The next spring, after French defeats on the Rhine and in Italy, responsibility for the defense of France lay in his hands. Rather than wait to be encircled, he attacked and won a brilliant victory over Austrian and Russian forces at the Battle of Zurich. Rewarded with command of the Army of Italy, Massena led a heroic defense of Genoa in 1800. He was eventually starved into surrender, but his stubborn defense bought Napoleon enough time to cross the Alps and defeat the Austrians at Marengo. Physically exhausted by this last ordeal and surrounded by accusations of corruption, Massena was recalled to Paris and went into semi-retirement. When he was made a marshal by Napoleon in 1804, he seemed distinctly underwhelmed and on being congratulated remarked, there are 14 of us. But Massena was one of the few marshals who proved themselves in independent command, making him a priceless asset to Napoleon. In 1805, he was recalled to active service and given command of the Army of Italy in the war against the Third Coalition. Massena kept Archduke Charles's army busy in Italy, while the Emperor won his great victories at Ulm and Austerlitz. In 1806, Massena oversaw the occupation of the Kingdom of Naples, ordering brutal reprisals against local resistance. In 1807, he commanded 5th Corps in Poland, but his role covering Warsaw meant he missed the major battles of Eilau and Friedland. Later that year, while out hunting with the Emperor and his entourage at Fontainebleau, he was accidentally shot in the face and lost the use of an eye. Napoleon, a notoriously bad shot, was to blame. <laughs> while Marshal Berti claimed responsibility. Yeah, yeah, these are politicians going out hunting. There was an incident here with Dick Cheney where he shot somebody in the chest or something while they were out hunting or something like that. You know, they're out there playing with guns, boy. Shooting each other. The war against Austria in 1809 saw Massena back near his best. His corps formed the vanguard for the crossing of the Danube and fought ferociously to hold the village of Asper against an overwhelming Austrian onslaught. Massena was everywhere, displaying his usual coolness under fire, and when ordered to retreat, ensured his troops pulled back across the river in good order. The battle was a defeat, but Massena had been superb. Together, he and the Emperor oversaw preparations for the next attempt to cross the Danube six weeks later. The Austrians were waiting for them at the Battle of Wagram. Because of a riding accident a few days earlier, Massena had to command his corps from a carriage. He made a fine target for Austrian gunners, but was still able to organize a complex redeployment of his corps at the height of the battle covered by Marshal Bessier's cavalry charge. Massena's bold maneuver secured the French left flank and won further praise from Napoleon. Massena, already ennobled as the Duke of Rivoli, received a new title, Prince of Essling, and another less welcome reward, command of French forces for the invasion of Portugal. 
Now, I have a, I have a question. Tell me, Don Milo, because they, they seem to be just giving out titles. Were these titles really important? Or were they just like dressing prince of this, duke of that, this, that, the other? Were they, did they hold importance? Did they have authority? Did they, were they able to... I mean, socially speaking, I guess they would, but I mean, politically speaking and deep down inside, they will, will, will these stay because it's kind of like the day people get knighted. You know what I mean? Musicians get knighted, ball players get knighted. Did they get knighted back in the day too, or was it mainly for you know uh, soldiers and, and, and upper 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 echelon people you know what i mean what are, these, what are these titles of vast importance or you know let me know in the bottom tell me something tell me something masena was deeply reluctant to go and complained bitterly about his appointment he was showing clear signs of exhaustion and was plagued by rheumatism and bad lungs when he arrived in spain general foy observed He's only 52, but he looks more than 60. He's lost weight and has begun to stoop. His glance, since the accident in which he lost an eye, has lost its keenness. His subordinates, already underwhelmed by his appearance, were outraged that the Marshal also decided to bring along his mistress, poorly disguised as an officer of dragoons. <laughs> the My man is like, I'm dying, I'm gonna get me mine. Undone by Wellington's scorched earth tactics, the hostile population and terrain, and Massena's own lethargic leadership. His corps commanders, especially Marshal Ney, were scathing of his conduct. At Busaco, Massena squandered lives with an unnecessary frontal attack on a strong British position. When he reached Lisbon, he found the city protected by new fortifications the impregnable lines of Torres Vedras. Masena waited outside Lisbon for reinforcements that never came, while sickness and guerrilla raids took their toll on his army. Five months later, he recrossed the mountains back into Spain, leaving a string of devastated villages behind him. The next summer, at Fuentes de Onoro, Masena attacked Wellington's army once more, and despite much hard fighting, again failed to win a clear victory. He blamed Marshal Bessier for his lack of support. But the Emperor's patience was at an end. He sent Marshal Marmont to replace Massena, and when they next met, greeted him with the cutting words, So, Prince of Essling, you are no longer Massena. Massena's health was now in steep decline. He never held a major command again, though he was recalled in 1813 to supervise a military district in southern France. He died after a long illness in 1817. In his prime, Massena was a superb commander, incisive and dangerous, but he was past his best by the time he became a marshal. Nevertheless, there were enough sparks of his old brilliance to worry his adversaries. The Duke of Wellington once remarked, when Massena was supposed to be in the field, I never slept comfortably. Bessier, MacDonald, Massena. Twenty down, six to go. Join us for the next part of Napoleon's Marshals as we reveal our top six coming soon. All right. Most definitely we're going to be watching that. Oh, the top six coming right now. MacDonald has surpassed Maman as my favorite. You know what I mean? I like when they don't they speak their mind and they don't they don't bow down to nobody and thing and then all that political thing going on and all of that. You know what I mean? I'm gonna leave a link in the description for this video. Go to this channel, check all this stuff. They have a lot of cool stuff there. Watch them up and thing. You understand? In the meantime, y'all take care of each other. Cool runnings.